Hi guys, this is Vaish from Vaish IAS. So we are going to continue the Spectrum series which we had kept pending uh, uh, one, uh, a month ago. Uh, one month ago we had uploaded two videos which is uh, chapter 1 and the first half of chapter 2. So today we are going to do chapter 2 part 2 which is again the advent of Europeans. The part 1 was with about the advent of Portuguese into India and chapter 1 which was the first video was about the sources and approaches uh, which uh, which is followed by different historians to study about the uh, modern Indian history. So those who have not watched those two videos please watch that and then do this because it's better if we do it in order. So let's begin uh, the Spectrum textbooks chapter 2 part 2. Before going into the content uh, this is the last slide of the previous video actually I put it here to give you the answers because in the last video we had asked, the, asked these questions at the end of Portuguese uh, um, advent so many have many people have also answered it in the comment section i would just like to give you the answers myself the first question is which portuguese governor in india adopted the blue water policy so this uh, the answer is c francisco de almeida actually we are, while uh, reading about portuguese uh, governor generals three three names are important this uh, francisco de almeida uh, uh, alfonso de Al Albuquerque and uh, Nino da Cunha. These three names, A, B, C, these three are the names given in the Spectrum textbook and about them just two to three lines are important which you may need for prelims. So that is ex extensively covered in my previous video. So for this particular question, blue water policy, the answer is Francisco de Almeida. And uh, the next question uh, is like which is not introduced by Portuguese in India. So while doing that video, I had told you that cashew and tobacco were introduced by Portuguese. So which were not introduced are coconut and tapioca so one four so for both the question the answer is c so and at the end of this video also i'll be asking a few questions these are the questions from the pdfs which our team has prepared on different subjects uh, especially for me uh, modern indian history we have over 300 to 400 mcqs of different topics so when we take each topic or each uh, chapter in this textbook we will give you two or three questions each or you can buy the entire PDF, for that you can contact our Facebook page which is given at the end of this slide, facebook.com by Shayas. So let's continue. So after Portuguese, the next superpower or the next European power which came to India was the Dutch. Okay, so when we see Dutch, it's like a, it's not too much uh, extensive as that of Portuguese or the English. Just few things you need to remember, like when did they come and uh, what were their trading posts. So let's see, they arrived in 1602. So when did the Portuguese arrive? The Portuguese arrived in 1498, Vasco da Gama. So 1602 is Dutch, 1605 they established their first factory in Masulipatnam. So why you need to remember this? Because in prelims, UPSC have already asked like uh, one question, which were the superpowers who established their uh, first trading post at Surat? And they are given the options like, uh, English, French, Portuguese, Dutch are all the European powers. So there Dutch would, will not come because their the first factory was set up in Masuli Patnam which is in the eastern coast of India. So obviously when they came, Portuguese were already there. So they became started to become a threat to Portuguese and then conflicts arose between the two. So uh, you don't need to remember each name or each place which they took over from each other but uh, just for the sake of mentioning here, I mentioned they captured Nagapatnam from them. So important trading post and factories. This again you know do not need to remember. You should know that Surat was also one place where they had a trading post but the first one was at Masuli Patna. Okay. So these are the different names. So if you see even Cochin is there that is if you see Kerala or the Malabar coast Dutch had more influence over uh, compared to other European powers. Even the Portuguese had trading posts over there you can see it in the previous video. So what were the or what trade did they do? What were the goods carried? back them to carry back by them to Europe. So if you see indigo, textiles, silk, opium and uh, definitely main question is not going to come regarding anything related to Dutch. It has not come and it is not going to come. Maybe any comparative analysis if you need to do about the European past, you can remember these things like what they have done after coming to India. They have done they have established trading posts and have trade uh, done internal trade and as well as taken uh, goods from India to Europe. So indigo textiles and silk, opium and rice. Okay, so one thing uh, I need to uh, ask you, when we say Dutch, which modern European country are we referring to? You can just mention that in comments. 
just want to see whether you know it or not okay so after dutch obviously the english had come during almost the same time the 1600s so other than the portuguese the dutch also had the rivalry with anglo that is the british so this was actually the main reason for their decline also so we'll see how or what so basically the dutch who came to india had two motives one was to defeat and end portuguese rule in india because portuguese were the ones who were already there in india and establish dutch trade and factories across india so this is the basic i think for every superpower or the european power these are the two major motives so like i said they had a rivalry with the uh, anglo for reasons given here commercial interest in india as well as indonesia like at that time europe was trying to uh, establish colonies all over the uh, indian subcontinent or the southeast asia or later it will come to the south american continent of uh, brazil and all so that uh, these are the reasons dutch captured regions in indonesia killing several englishmen so obviously the rivalry will increase prolonged warfare underwent and finally compromised dutch withdrew from india and british withdrew from indonesia so that's how dutch came to decline in india they had exchanged territories and like exchange in the sense the authority was uh, interchanged or they decided like dutch will not interfere into indian subcontinent and british will not interfere into the southeast asia or the indonesian region so that's how the anglo dutch rivalry ended and two important wars which came at the end was the third anglo dutch war and the battle of hooghly like there were first anglo second anglo dutch wars and even after third i think there was a fourth anglo dutch war but these were the two important ones where the two had uh, faced each other especially when it comes to regions or territories within india okay so by 1759 if you see final blow to dutch ambitions in india so they came in 1602 and by 1759 the dutch rule or dutch uh, trading in india had come to an end this is all you need to know about dutch and i think maybe only one or two questions related to prelims can come from here so that is all about dutch so the next uh people who came to india was the english and which will be i think the uh, topic for all the other chapters in the spectrum textbook because we know like they ruled over india over 200 years so we have to go everything in detail but in this chapter we'll do only their entry and basic details so 1600 queen elizabeth gives a charter to east india company for trade so there they the government or the uh, um government's army did not come just like that uh, directly to rule over india initially they started as a trading company a pri- east india company was a private company which had got the rights to trade over india from the queen 1608 william hawkins reaches jahangir's court this has been asked multiple times by upsc like whose court did william hawkins come to india first so and he came with a uh, with a name to set up a factory at surat the like ghetto surat was the first factory of the british actually they had done trading in the east because uh, from 1600 to 1608 till they got the permission to set up a factory they had done internal trade in the eastern coast that is in masuli patnam and all but the first factory was at surat so in case if someone ask who this is the first factory of english it is surat and first trading post if they ask it will be masuli patnam okay so obviously op- opposition from the portuguese so because the portuguese were first to come they had a certain influence in the mughal court and they always tried to oppose them 1612 captain thomas best defeated portuguese impressed jahangir so this is how they proceeded 1613 established the first factory at surat so finally they got the permission and so the entire thing when it's happening the mughal ruler is jahangir you just need to remember like it is during the jahangir's time that they initially set up their trading uh, post or trading factory and started the trade 1615 thomas row see again he has reached jahangir's court with permission to set up factories at agra ahmedabad and roj so initial all the trading posts and all the permissions were got uh, by the permission from jahangir okay so after that how did they proceed then they st- this is all in uh, northern india uh, around the delhi region when it comes to south they had got trading uh, they have got a golden farmland so last once i think in one of the exams golden farm uh, from whom did golden uh, the british received the golden farmland 
so it was the sultan of golconda so you remember this because a lot of farmans will be there later when it reaches the battle of plassey and all those things when the trade uh, divani rights of bengal there are a lot of things which will be coming up in the next chapters so you have to know the uh, order or the rulers from which the british started getting each of the rights so golden farman is from sultan of golconda 1639 they got permission to fortify at madras so like you will be learning later english had uh, basically three presidencies uh, bombay bengal and madras so uh, in 1639 they got the permission to fortify at madras from the ruler of chandragiri so if anyone ask which was the first fort it will be madras it's not bombay it's not bengal first fort is at madras 1662 it received bombay as a dowry gift from portuguese so uh, it is actually true they had a marriage alliance between the british and the uh, british prince and the portuguese uh, 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 princess so for that they they had the dowry system actually it's not like the dowry is there only in india dowry was there among them the european powers and the british actually received bombay as a dowry gift from portuguese so if you see first was madras then they got bombay then after that they got the trade to bengal as well so that was the order madras bombay and bengal so that's how they received the permissions to trade madras bombay and bengal so here if it's mentioned like it's did not get did not get the permission to fortify at that time Seventeen seventeen, Farooqiyar's Farman. Farooqiyar is actually one of the later Mughal rulers. Actually, we'll be teaching you the uh, importance of the Mughal rulers after our visit because uh, there are certain prelims questions which can be formed out of those rulers. There are, there are about eight to ten rulers from uh, our visit to the last ruler Bahadur Shah, and they have done certain things which which was important in Indian history and which can be asked in prelims that we'll be dealing later. Now you have to remember, like Farooq Siyar was the one who gave the uh, farman of minting their own coins by the British. So this was actually is it also called a, also referred to as a blunder done by a Mughal ruler because some foreign power comes to trade in India, and if you give them the right to mint their own coins, what what does it mean? It means that they are issuing their own currency. So they are trying. It's like forming a parallel government itself. so this was a big blunder and which will actually cause the downfall of even the moguls and uh, which will make the english a major superpower later so this is one important thing you need to remember the golden farman by sultan of golconda and the uh, minting coins permission by farooq siyar so that was the entry of english rest of the english uh, related things we learn in the next chapters now the entry of danes into india so this again i need you people to tell me in comments when you tell danes or danish which modern european country does it refer to so two questions one is who is dutch uh, in the present world and who is danes okay so danes actually it's very um, what to say it's not at all important for you to learn because they did not even have an ambition to uh, acquire lot of territories or expand their imperial power or anything they were majorly focused more towards uh christianity they wanted to convert most or uh, they wanted to spread the christianity in india or indian subcontinent so they were more mostly focused on that thing and so they could not grow much in india see like i told very less significant more focus on missionary activities they entered in 1616 so if you see like uh, the order the portuguese came first around 1600 and 1602 not two dutch and the english came 1616 the danes come now one more power will come which is again a major power which is the french which will be which will be dealing in the next slide so you need to just remember the trading post again because in case prelims question comes up like uh, uh, trankyobar and serampur which super power uh, super european power is it related to then you just need to pick danes from the options so if you see the location i have put the location here uh, let me just highlight it for you trankyobar is here and serampur is near calcutta yeah so these two were the important trading posts and see the first factory also for danes is trankyobar so there's no surat or no masuri patnam as first one. so the first one till now we have seen for surat it was only british later many factories sold to british in 1845 so that's all about the uh, danes they just came tried to set up two trading post uh, focused on the missionary activities 
and they sold all their territories to British later and left. So this is uh, all about Danes. Next is French. So this is, I think, uh, if any superpower could or European power could actually give a bit of rivalry or conflict uh, competition to British, they were the French. So French, if you see, again in the map I have shown you the main locations, we will see some data about them. The French were the last Europeans to enter. So this was actually one question which came in prelims, like who were the European power which was the first to come and which was the last to come. Actually the answer for that is Portuguese, even the first and the last, both are Portuguese. But the last, first and last, I am telling to enter and leave. But who are the last to enter? That is French. 1664. So if you see the timeline now, it is actually about 50 to 60 years later than the Danes came. So they got monopoly and trade from the king. They set up first factory at Surat. So again, Surat has come. So now since we have covered all the European powers, the answer to that question which I have told earlier was English and the French. They were the two European powers who set up their first factory at Surat. Remaining all others had set up at different places. 1673. Established township at Chandarnagar near Calcutta. This is actually shown in the map here. Chandarnagar. 1674. Settlement at Pondicherry. Nerve centre of French power in India. So Pondicherry, now even if you go now to Pondicherry, you can see a lot of buildings which is of French architecture style and so like we say Goa, when we say Goa, we immediately connected to Portuguese. Similarly, when we say, like, say Pondicherry, we should immediately uh, connect it to French. And this is just a trick I used to remember the French possessions of French territory in India. My PK, M by PK. So left side you can see this Mahi I am highlighting in the map. Yanon, Pondicherry, Karakal. So if you learn my PK, you can get it actually in the order from north to south. Mahi will be in the left and then YPK. So you will not get confused if someone in case asks, they will ask you about the location. So this is how the locations are located. Now we saw like the Dutch were de defeated by the British. The Danes sold everything and left. Now when it comes to French, they had uh, uh, good army or good navy and governor generals compared uh, compared to other two Dutch and Danes. So they could give a good uh, rivalry or conflict with the, to the British. So we will see about them. One important name you have to remember is Duplex. Duplex actually UPC mains question has already come uh, like about uh, why Duplex could not uh, uh, overpower the British. So we will see some details about him and how the Anglo-French uh, rivalry uh, proceeded. So actually three wars were fought. It is called the Carnatic Wars. So this is also one prelims question. Carnatic wars, if somebody mentions, between whom was it fought? Carnatic wars were fought between the British on one side and the French on the other side. There were three Carnatic wars actually. In one slide we will do all the three. We just need to remember one thing. British always took more than a war, not just one war. They took more wars to come, uh, fight with any, uh, power, any superpower, whether it's French now or later when we see the Mysore uh, wars or the Maratha wars, Sikh wars, Afghan wars, they had conflict with almost everyone but for everything they had more than one war and after each war they have a treaty and in, in the treaty they will just uh, exchange territories or like uh, um, uh, write a clause like we will not interfere in your territory, you will not interfere in our territory and they will just close it but again in few years time they will again come with next war so but end result is like always the British had won till India got independence almost everything British had been winning so we will see now the details of French Carnatic war Sorry, first Carnatic War. So if you see, this was actually an extension of the Anglo-French War, which was already happening in Europe. In Europe at that time, there was a war uh, related to Austrian War of Succession. Uh, the, there was a conflict going on, like who will be the next successor after the death of a prince. So that time, they had, uh, one side was supported by the British and other side by the French, and they had uh, a rivalry. Actually, the British, France, if you see England and France, it's like modern day India and Pakistan. They had at that time the biggest rivalry and they were fighting with each other even for territory or possessions or uh, becoming the supreme power. They always wanted to, like India-Pakistan is not the case but if you just want to relate it with any example of the modern uh, 
modern day the boundary was that much fragile and they had always conflicts with each other so here uh, max the following questions is what can be expected for prelims for mains we can uh, get lot of data that we will be covering after some time but for prelims uh, sake the three wards and what were the treaties so here again uh, how i remember is a p p f ex la chapel pondicherry and paris these are the three treaties which were signed after the three carnatic wars you don't need to remember like what was exchanged in each treaty and all but you should know like when we say ex la chapel it was related to anglo french because there are a lot of treaties which you will learn we have we will be making mcqs of course and we will be giving you tricks also later so as and when we teach we will tell you small small tricks like this app or something so that you will get used to it when you learn so the first one like it was a continuation of what was happening in europe already so they took some places from each other and finally again exchanged it after the treaty this is what happened in first so the timeline also you can see 1740s so this is happening actually before the other important wars like battle of plassey and all where british will be fighting with the indians so first carnatic war then second carnatic war again see here it was a succession in india uh, nizamul mulk which is actually the ruler of the uh, hyderabad there again succession di dispute came in these two guys will enter in both sides they will just fight with each other and what was happening was each time british was winning and french was losing and they were having financial losses so slowly slowly french is losing their territories possessions money and all and they will finally decline so see trade treaty of pondicherry no more future interference in state dispute so they will do something they will interfere and finally they will do a treaty like they will not interfere again this is what they usually do the third carnatic war at the same time again in europe seven year war, war was happening seven seven year war is very important in world history perspective 1756 to 16 uh, sorry 1763 and so meanwhile in at the same time 1758 to 63 it happened in india also so if anyone ask what is the final blow or the final war in which french declined this is the one battle of vandy wash which happened in 1760 which is in the mid term of this seven year war so again treaty of paris was signed french confined to enclaves these are the enclaves which i showed you in the previous slide that is my pk and that chandranagar near bengal so those five they had just those few places and english became a super power actually chandranagar also will be gone because uh, bengal will become a very uh, crucial uh, place for english later on so friends will be my pk mahi yana pondicherry and karaikal so this is how the french also came uh, tried their best and declined actually duplex could not achieve this uh, thing because of various reasons which will be seen in the next slide see reasons for english success this was exactly the question which was asked in mains why was english more successful than other european powers so if you see first thing is the structure of trading company when we started this video we had told the east india company was a private company but when it comes to the french company it was actually uh, government sponsored or the uh, uh, representative of the government so they always for each and everything they have to go and ask permission or they had to uh, uh, think before allocating the Uh, funds or uh, maintaining the army and all. so that was one major reason uh, english could uh, succeed they had enough trading their own trading they had enough revenue they could invest or do whatever they wanted and they control their trade and uh, possessions and invasions everything by themselves in india excellent navy and military actually both had a good military power and good generals but every time british was a notch higher more stable government back again in europe as i said they had conflicts and the british was again well organized later you will learn like india when they forming the constitution they have borrowed lot of things from the uh, british parliament because they had a stable government right from the uh, uh, early times like 1600s or 1500 they had a very good government setup less zeal for religion again when you see dutch and danes and all you saw like they had a uh, more interest in uh, christian missionaries and converting people to christianity but english were well focused on their trade and they knew how to uh, gain possessions one after the other see never undermine commercial interest so whatever happens they never uh, gave or kept a, uh, gave away or kept apart their trading activities the trading was well flourished and they had a lot of revenue and they had efficient governor generals and noble personalities to take their trade forward then control on three presidencies 
while the other uh, European powers were trying to get uh, possession of small small enclaves, what you, uh, British people done is they have gathered a group of uh, uh, small small places and combined into three major presidencies across India. So in the map of India, left side they had the whole Bombay presidency which they got as dowry. South they had the Madras which they fortified after getting permission from the ruler of Chandragiri. And in the eastern side they had uh, Bengal which uh, which they had a total control which we will see later how they got control over Bengal. But so entire India they had their control and so it was easier for them to move their army or uh, get into the conflicts and more disciplined. Again, their government, their army, their trading act, everything were more disciplined compared to any other European powers. Okay, so this is the entire. I'll take about the duplex uh, related things later. It's again a kind of same point if you compare with English. The du uh, duplex was an efficient governor general, but problem is like he was a short sighted kind of person. He did not uh, have a great plan like the British. He just thought of something, he'll do something, but he did not get the result. He won't, uh, also he won't go into war himself. He would send his army men. But in the English side, if you see, they had efficient people like uh, Robert Clive and all who actually leads the Battle of Plassey, Battle of Buxar, they had Hector Monroe, they had a lot of people who will themselves go into the war and they will take control of the places. But Duplex was just like a commanding officer and even the people under him did not like his behavior, his autocratic behavior or his uh, overruling authority kind of power or behavior were not appreciated by his own army men. So obviously they will not find success in the long run. So those are some reasons which maybe we can do it later. In this chapter it's, there is no much details about him which we have to cover. I will give you just again three questions which I want to answer, which you I want you to answer in the comment section. All these three you can answer if you had seen this video. So let's see the questions. Which of the following are matched correctly? So obviously it was mentioned. I also told you a trick so you can tell uh, by looking at the options which of the following are correctly matched. The second question, which of the following are, are reasons for failure of general duplex? So this actually I didn't put the content but I put a question. So you as Based on what I have told you, I think you will be able to answer it. I will just read out the statements. He often planned for long term but failed to take decisions in critical situations. He himself did not go out for war. He just made plans and assigned to other generals and governors. Many of his generals did not like his autocratic behaviors and they often quarreled on several matters. Actually, the answer for this I will tell you here itself because we did not cover in content. The answer is 1, 2, 3 only. The option D. This is what I want to tell you. He planned for long term. He had ambitions in mind, but he did not make a strategic plans to actually implement them in short term. Okay. The last one again, which was the following are the reasons for failure of French against British in India. Better army, more bases for British. Yes, he was a private company, stronger governor generals for Britain, higher finance base for Britain. So I think you can answer this also, but just for the sake for our satisfaction to know whether you have listened to the video and have concentrated on it, just answer this on the comment section. Uh, so I think chapter 1 and 2 were very simple and you have got an idea of how the Europeans came to India. Now chapter 3 onwards, chapter 3 is also another simple one, we will see it tomorrow. After that I think from 4th chapter onwards, the actual British consolidation and expansion in India will begin where you have to focus more and you have to if you can you can make notes also from this video we have actually picked up all the important points which are very much important for prelims from the spectrum textbook and given to you actually spectrum itself is a very precise book which has been prepared by taking points from Vipin Chandra so we are again doing a filtration from the uh, spectrum textbook so that you can easily get the points alone which are important for the exam so, hope you guys, hope you guys enjoyed the video and got some information about the European powers to India. For any doubts, you can contact our Facebook page and the questions which we have given, please try to answer them and give us your feedback. And if you need the complete set of 300 to 400 MCQs based on the entire Spectrum textbook or the NCRTs, you can contact our Facebook page. We'll give you the details of how to get it from us. So until the next video, keep uh, learning, keep practicing, have a good day. Thank you.